Welcome to Gleaning in God's Word. We're continuing our study of Lamentations 1.1. In this video, we will look at the Hebrew word for princess. By way of review, Lamentations 1.1 begins with a comparison of Jerusalem's deplorable state with her former prosperous condition. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How is she become as a widow? She that was great among the nations, and princess among the provinces, how is she become a tributary? In previous videos, we've looked at the acrostic word how, and the word for widow. In this video, we will look at the word princess, and so let's uh, move forward. At one time, Israel, or Jerusalem, was like a princess or a noblewoman. The Hebrew word is Sarah, Strong's number 8282. Jerusalem was like a princess among the nations. The noun Sarah is the feminine form of the masculine noun Sar, which describes a prince, captain, chief, or other ruler. This word has uh, equivalents in uh, several other languages. In German, it's Kaiser. In Latin, you have the Caesars. In Russian, you have the Tsar. These all come from the, uh, the same root word. The noun has the same pronunciation and spelling as the verb Sara, strong number 8280, which means to have power. Now, the name of Israel Yisrael, is a derivative of that verb, Sarah. And in Scripture, the only two occurrences of that verb concern Jacob and his surname. In Genesis 32, God described Jacob as one having power with God, and that therefore he called him Israel. Now the common noun that we're going to be studying in this video has the same pronunciation and spelling as the proper name, Sarah, Hebrew Sarah, strong number 8283. And in the Hebrew manuscripts, everything is written in uh, the uppercase letters. So one can only determine whether something is a common noun or a proper noun by context. And Sarah, of course, was Abraham's wife. Now, in our next video, we will take a look at the proper noun, which is actually should be considered part of this word study, but there was too much material to put into a 20-minute video. So I decided to make two 20-minute videos out of it. So in our next video, we will look at the proper noun. But we can see already that... Uh, the noun that we're studying today has some strong links in the form of its word to the nation of Israel. And of course, ultimately, we want to look for connections to the advents of Jesus, primarily his first advent, but also uh, foresha things foreshadowing his second advent, because those are linked to the letter Aleph. So, after looking at the etymology, Let's see where the common noun shows up in Scripture. And according to my references, uh, the common noun only occurs in four other passages of Scripture. So, five occurrences in all. In Judges, in 1 Kings, in Esther, and Isaiah. So, with so few occurrences, rather than applying the rule of first mention, which we discussed in our last video, we will briefly look at all four passages in which the common noun appears, and then we will discuss common or related themes among those passages. So as we move through this, we're going to be looking for commonality in trends or, or themes. So the first occurrence of the common noun is in Deborah's song. And in her song, which is given in Judges chapter 5, she sang of wise ladies that served Sisera's mother. Now, Sisera's mother was waiting for her son, Sisera, 
the commander of Jabin's armies, to return from his attacks against Israel. Jabin was the ruler of Hazor in northern Canaan, as described in Judges chapter 4. Well, these wise ladies, or princesses, wrongly assumed that Sisera and his men were delayed because they were busy dividing the spoils of victory. Unbeknownst to them, Sisera would never return, because a woman named Jael, or Jael, had driven a tent peg through his temple. And that's recorded in Judges chapter 4 also. Okay, well, it's tough to detect a trend off of a single data point, so let's move to uh, the next occurrence. And this occurs in a passage in 1 Kings, and this passage describes some errors made by Solomon, at least errors in the eyes of the Lord. Solomon had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, which turned his heart away from the Lord, as described in 1 Kings 11.3. According to the Lord's instructions, Israel's kings were not to multiply horses, wives, silver, or gold unto themselves, and, as is recorded in 1 Kings, Solomon did all those things. So Solomon made some mistakes in the eyes of the Lord, and it turned his heart away from the Lord. Now, Israel's material prosperity peaked during Solomon's reign. Jerusalem truly was a princess among the provinces. However, this passage shows that the heart of the king and the nation, well, they were drawn away from the Lord by the fullness of bread and idleness. And you might want to pause the video and look at those different references cited there in Deuteronomy, 1 Chronicles, and Ezekiel. And this resulted in the nation's downfall. And as we move farther into Lamentations, we are going to see that Solomon's reign is a focal point. So in the developing theme, in the Song of Deborah, the people that were singing the songs thought that something very good was going on and that Cicero was counting the spoils of war and that's why he was long in coming. Here in this passage we see Solomon at the peak of prosperity with many wives, concubines, horses, silver, and gold, but his heart had turned from the Lord and that's not a good thing. So we're seeing something that's going to result in the nation's downfall. Now let's move to the third passage. When we go to Esther, the context is discussing a hypothetical situation in which the ladies of Persia would hear about Vashti's disobedience to King Ahasuerus in Esther 1.18. Ahasuerus had commanded his queen to appear before him so that his friends could admire her great beauty, but she would not comply. Her disobedience angered the king, and his advisors caused Ahasuerus to create a law in which Vashti, Vashti would eventually be replaced by another queen. And as uh, those familiar with the story know, eventually Esther replaced Vashti as queen. So Vashti was feeling her oats. She'd stood up to her husband, and she was probably yucking it up with uh, her lady friends who were also princesses of other nations, and said, boy, I showed that guy, didn't I? Well, while she was celebrating, her downfall and her removal as queen of the provinces was on the way. So we have another situation in which there was misplaced rejoicing in some apparent prosperity or victory. So summarizing, all three passages, wise ladies or princesses, they were at moments of presumed prosperity. The ladies of Cicero's mother thought Cicero was dividing spoils of victory. Solomon's princesses were in the courts of the richest, wisest king that the world had known. In the third passage, Queen Vasti was hosting a feast for the princesses of the royal household and perhaps other nations. So life was good. They were having their parties. They did not realize, however, that bad news was on its way. It just had not yet arrived.
So the preceding passages set the stage for understanding the significance of the fourth and final passage in which the common noun Sarah occurs in the Old Testament. The fourth occurrence is in a prophecy of Isaiah, and he prophesied about what would befall Gentile kings and queens that tormented Israel. And that prophecy is in Isaiah 49. And I will emphasize uh, the key parts of that passage in Aqua in this coming slide. Reading Isaiah 49, 22 through 26. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders, and kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens, the Hebrew word Sarah, thy nursing mothers. And here's the key point. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive be delivered? But thus saith the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contended with thee, and I will save thy children, and I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So in this prophecy, Isaiah shows that Gentile kings and queens will become servants that will bow down before their former captives and lick the dust off their feet. So these are men and women that would have been atop the social ladder in their respective nations, governing many times with absolute authority. And now these that were at the top are going to become like lowly servants before those that were formerly their captives. This could be a reference to uh, the rulers of Babylon or other Gentile nations that have trodden down the nation of Israel. Jesus told us that for a time Gentiles will tread upon the city of Jerusalem until God has determined that their time has come, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, which he spoke of in Luke 21, 24. So we see this persisting theme, as in the other three passages that we looked at. The bad news for the Gentile queens has not yet arrived, but the word of the prophet is sure and their bad news is also on its way. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 spoke of judgment coming upon those that would take Israel captive. And there are some passages in the New Testament as well that will show Israel prevailing over her enemies. Isaiah's prophecy for the Gentiles is like what Jeremiah's words were for Israel. The distinction being, Jeremiah just spoke his words after the bad news had already arrived instead of before. The nation of Israel had been warned many times by the prophets that if they did not forsake their idolatry, God would come and carry them away and make them captives in another land. And this warning goes all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. The first 15 verses or so talks about the blessings that they would enjoy in the land if they obeyed God and his commandments. And then he goes on for something like 50 more verses on all the bad things that are going to happen if they disobeyed God's word when they entered into the land. And as we will see as we move through Lamentations, many of those prophecies made by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 28 are indeed fulfilled in Jeremiah's account of what was going on in Jerusalem after they had been conquered. Jeremiah's description of Jerusalem's former state as a princess pointed to the days of Solomon in which the nation began drifting away from the Lord at the peak of her prosperity.
So her abundance, her fullness of bread, was actually the beginning of her downfall. And I've heard it said many times that we are at our most vulnerable when we are successful because pride can creep in. When we are facing a calamity or a struggle, a tribulation or a trial, that drives us towards seeking the Lord. But when prosperity strikes, what do they record on the Vizio? Hey, I'm going to Disneyland. Time to party hardy and forget about our troubles. And unfortunately, they forget about the Lord and the blessings that he brought upon them. After Solomon died, Israel became a divided nation. His son Rehoboam listened to uh, some bad advice, and instead of easing up on the nation with respect to taxation, he was going to, to double down on it and, and be even more severe than his father's was. And what we'll see as we move through Lamentations is the good old days of Solomon. They may have been good for Solomon, but they could have been very difficult days in reality for many of the people of Israel. Yes, he was a wise king and prosperous, and there was plenty to be had, but the taxes were severe, and uh, Solomon maybe got a bit greedy, especially as his heart was turned away from the Lord. And as the once wealthy nation drifted farther away from the Lord, Eventually, it came to the point where she was a tribute payer or a tributary, and eventually she went into captivity when she could no longer appease her enemies with the nation's wealth because all the wealth was taken, so they got plundered a little bit at a time. Nevertheless, Isaiah's prophecy looks to a time in which God will restore and redeem Israel and make her like a queen once again. And this is where we will pick up links to uh, the advents of Jesus and some about his first coming and some about his second coming. But to complete the connection to Aleph in the advents of Jesus, we have to take up a discussion of the proper noun, Sarah, or Sarah as the Hebrews would say it, in our next video, uh, GGW-6. So thank you for watching and... As always, please subscribe. It really would help to get the uh, get this site noticed by people outside of uh, my little group. So if you haven't subscribed already, please do so. Thank you for watching, and we'll have another video for you in uh, a couple weeks.